Thanks a lot, Jeremy, and thanks for uh, putting together these webinars in general. Uh, this is actually the first time this paper is seeing the light of day, so I'm really looking forward to any feedback that you have on it. Uh, it's joint work with Snail Banerjee at UCSD and my colleague uh, Yvonne at Stanford. And the paper is really motivated by a couple of ideas that I think we all take for granted here, which is that stock prices reflect two different types of information information that's being released by firms, and then information that's being traded on by investors and impounded into, the, into prices via their demands. In addition, we know that a lot of the information that's being released by firms to markets has a component of discretion on the part of management. So things like management forecasts and earnings guidance, uh, managers have the ability to withhold these sorts of disclosures if they so choose. So we're asking a couple of simple questions here. First of all, uh, how do these two types of information interact? And we wanna think about it from both sides. So how does the information that managers voluntarily disclose to the market influence how prices are aggregating uh, investors, different private information signals? And on the other hand, how is trade on private information among investors influencing the incentives of managers to disclose information? So a fairly simple set of questions uh, regarding some fundamental topics in accounting, but if we look at the existing literature, uh, there hasn't really been that much work that considers these two types of information jointly. Okay, so we have two major classes of models that show up throughout accounting research. We have voluntary disclosure models that are really thinking about the manager's incentives to disclose information. But these models tend to think about markets in a rather stylized fashion. They tend to think about, uh, say, prices equaling expected future cash flows, or maybe they'll add some sort of uh, simple risk premium. But with a few exceptions that I'll discuss momentarily, they're not thinking about a more elaborate trading game uh, or, a, or a more elaborate way of uh, modeling markets. On the other hand, we have these tremendously influential models of trade among investors on private information uh, when investors are learning from prices. But these models, when they do think about disclosure, uh, typically think about it as a mandatory disclosure or some sort of signal that the firm has committed to releasing independent of what its value is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna develop a model that builds in features of uh, both of these two frameworks. Okay, so in our model, we'll have a manager of a firm who can disclose verifiable idiosyncratic information. I'll come back in a moment to why I'm emphasizing the fact that it's idiosyncratic. Uh, and this manager is going to face a market that consists of risk averse investors that have dispersed private information signals and potentially learn from price. Now we're gonna allow for some flexibility in the financial market. Uh, so we're not just gonna think about the case in which investors are fully utilizing the information in price, uh, which we would refer to as sort of the noisy rational expectations case. But we'll also think about the case where they dismiss the information in price, or even the case in which they're just partially uh, utilizing the information in price. And as we'll see, the reason we're doing so is because it generates some interesting insights into how trade in financial markets influences prices uh, in the presence of voluntary disclosure. Now, on our baseline model, we're going to be thinking about the fact or the idea that disclosure and unraveling could be prevented because managers face a cost uh, to disclosing. But we're also going to extend the model to the other commonly used disclosure friction, the die friction, in which there's uncertainty uh, over whether the manager has information in the first place. So just a brief overview of what we're finding. The first thing we show is that just as in standard models of voluntary disclosure, there's going to be an equilibrium in which the manager discloses sufficiently good news and withholds sufficiently bad news. Okay, so we'll refer to this as a threshold equilibrium. This equilibrium is also going to be uh, unique in our model. But what we will show is that while we have sort of a standard form of an equilibrium, a lot of features of this equilibrium are going to change relative to models without trade on private information. Okay, so 
the first thing that we show is that if you're thinking about the quality of public information entering into the time at which the manager can voluntarily disclose information, uh, when you increase the quality of this information, it can actually encourage uh, more voluntary disclosure on the part of the manager. Okay. Uh, and so typically, the idea is that when you have better information of one type, it tends to crowd out uh, information of another type, but we'll find that's not necessarily the case in our model, which is consistent with uh, a rather mixed set of empirical results on this question. So we have just a couple of papers here listed on the side of uh, crowding out or more public information or more mandatory disclosure, uh, less voluntary disclosure. And these papers tend to show that you have an exogenous shock to the quality of mandatory disclosure results in managers following up by increasing the amount of information they're voluntarily providing. But on the other hand, there's several papers that find the exact opposite, showing that we often see associations between higher quality mandatory disclosure uh, and greater amounts of voluntary disclosure. So our model is going to provide some insight into when you might expect to see a crowding in or a crowding out relationship. And what we show is that it depends upon the level of disclosure costs and the amount of private information in the market. So when disclosure costs are high and there's a lot of private information, this is when we'll get this potential for crowding in. So I have a general question about that. Um, yes. This is outside of your paper, but these papers seem to assume that mandatory disclosure is exogenous. That's true in the theory, but it's also true in the, uh, in the empirical. Uh, but I find this assumption to be really hard to swallow because the way government act is they, they respond. So the amount of mandatory is a choice. So uh, I've worked on that issue. So once you view mandatory not as an exogenous realization of, I don't know, something came in in the regulator's mind. Um, so I'm asking more generally, is it necessarily the right way to think about mandatory disclosure as some kind of exogenous states that moves around? You know, it's probably not. I think you're right that uh, governments act in response to various pressures uh, and those pressures themselves might in some way be related to voluntary disclosure. So there's certainly identification challenges in assessing the validity of these sorts of theories uh, in, that are basically present in all of these literatures, even the ones that tend to be uh, viewed as sort of better identified. So going back to your paper, is there a notion we could we could also extend it by endogenizing the amount of public information? Uh, so I think we'd have to, at least given the way that you're thinking about it, we would have to model a regulator in their objective function, uh, which, you know, I think it would be potentially interesting. But our goal here is to take sort of the most off the shelf models of voluntary disclosure and trade on, on private information and just see what happens when we merge them. So we want to sort of stick as closely as possible to the existing literature and questions in those two literatures. Yeah, because the cost is interesting. And so you have comparative static on the cost, but of course, the greater the cost, the more the proprietary motives are going to affect uh, the gap and, and how people respond, uh, how the regulator applies gap. So they're going to reduce the amount of, of, of public disclosure in response to a shock, in response to cost, right? Uh, yeah, I guess I'd have to think about exactly what you mean by that more. So if you if you have a higher cost of disclosure, any accounting regulators would ask less mandatory disclosure from firms. Yeah, well, I guess it depends on how you're thinking about the cost. If it's just a deadweight loss, then I think that's true. But if it's like a proprietary cost, then, you know, it depends on whether that's helping other firms to increase their innovation or something like that. If I may chime in here, uh, so Jeremy, are you thinking of your own model where the regulator is trying to minimize disclosure costs, and that's sort of what determines the quality of information? Well, I guess uh, I guess in that setting, you would uh, want to. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. So I've done that as a as a normative regulator, but you also have other ways to think about a political aspect, or I mean, all of my work has been in thinking about the mandatory not being exogenous. So I guess I'm just uh, bitching about <laughs> the way we think, uh, where most of the papers think about the problem, which is yours. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's definitely interesting things to, to think about in the context of crowding in versus crowding out. Okay, so our second sort of novel result relative to the existing literature has to do with the firm's valuation relative to its expected uh, cash flows. So what we're gonna show is that uh, firms tend to be either underpriced or overpriced relative to their expected cash flows as a result of voluntary disclosure. And I wanna uh, remind you that we're assuming that the disclosure is idiosyncratic uh, which means that this result should be somewhat surprising. The fact that disclosure is influencing prices, even though it's purely idiosyncratic. So if you consider models without voluntary disclosure in which disclosure is just a mandatory uh, non-strategic release of information, or if you consider models without private information, in either case, you're gonna get that idiosyncratic information has no influence uh, on prices on average. Okay, so it's only when you combine these two elements that we show that you can get an effect on purely firm specific information on expected prices. Okay, and so we view this as somewhat important because uh, a lot of the information that firms are releasing is firm specific. It's hard to think about many firms who are providing information that helps the market learn about market wide risk. Uh, that wouldn't be available from some other source like economic forecasts, other firms, disclosures, et cetera. And we'll show that the direction of the impact of idiosyncratic information on prices depends upon whether investors are utilizing the information in prices. If they exhibit rational expectations, we tend to get an undervalued firm. While if they agree to disagree and ignore the information prices, uh, we show that you can get overvaluation. So again, we think this kind of speaks to the literature on uh, disclosure and returns and cost of capital, where a lot of the disclosures people are looking at are idiosyncratic, uh, and yet they these authors tend to rest on theories that rely on information having a systematic component. And somewhat not surprisingly, uh, they tend to find mixed evidence. So our results suggest that the direction of the relationship that you might find could depend upon things like the sophistication of investors that determine whether they're fully utilizing the information in prices. These results also speak to an asset pricing literature on idiosyncratic return skewness, which tends to show that these stocks that look kind of like lotteries, um, so that have a lot of positive skewness, tend to earn less positive returns. Okay, on the flip side, stocks that have a lot of downside risk tend to earn more positive returns. What's surprising here though, is that this is purely idiosyncratic skewness. So again, according to conventional asset pricing theory, it's hard to explain why you would get these relationships. Uh, and people have tended to uh, utilize behavioral explanations. Well, we're sort of gonna offer a rational explanation that's linked to voluntary disclosure, which is that voluntary disclosure tends to lead to negative skewness if you don't disclose. Okay, so in a voluntary disclosure game, you tend to get this threshold equilibrium, which is what we show again arises in our model. This means you kind of cut off the upper tail of the possibilities for the firm's value because they would have disclosed those values. And so you're just left with the lower tail or negative skewness. So when we find that the firm is undervalued and there's negative skewness conditional on non-disclosure, it's consistent with the empirical findings in this literature. So, We'll also look at the case where uh, we have this die friction. Uh, if I have time, I'll try and tell you what happens here. But the gist is that you can actually have a threshold equilibrium breakdown uh, when investors have a lot of information precision. On the other hand, when investors' information precision is low uh, and costs are also high, you recover the same exact results that we get in the case where the manager is known to be informed. So Kevin, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. And just if you don't get to the die uh, by the end of the time, yeah. when you say the equilibrium breaks down, can you identify uh, the threshold equilibrium breaks down? Can you identify a not threshold equilibrium or you can't no, identify so equilibrium? It's very difficult to do so because 
uh, effectively what you'll, the only other type of equilibrium that could exist would show would be one where you have a disjoint set of intervals on which the manager discloses that are bounded from below. Uh, so that's as far as we can get. The problem is that when you start to think about prices in that setting, uh, it just becomes entirely intractable because you're dealing with risk averse investors trading in a security that uh, has multiple disjoint intervals of payoffs. So, so have you considered big strategy, Gabriel? I mean, we, we have a separate project, you know, with the die model and public info and public and private information in which the standard threshold breaks down, but we do have a mixed strategy equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think even in a mixed strategy equilibrium, our, it would be fairly intractable to try and resolve these issues because you still end up with, it's probably getting even weirder distributions to try and deal with. Mm -hmm. So it is an unfortunate part of our paper that we're not able to actually characterize what happens there. So Kevin, may, may, I, may I add up on that? So what exactly makes it so untractable? Is it the investor's risk aversion uh, or, or you, you, I mean, that you have to impose that typical market clearing condition. So what, what makes it so difficult to, to, uh, to get deeper there? It's basically all of those things. Um, it's private information in conjunction with risk aversion. And, you know, we can actually write down potentially a general idea of what price looks like. What's difficult is saying um, effectively what happens when the managers observes a higher signal. Okay, so for a threshold equilibrium to exist, it has to be that higher type managers are more willing or more inclined to disclose, or that's at least a sufficient condition that tends to hold in these models, but might not hold in these more nuanced equilibria. Um, because if you have multiple disjoint intervals, this just characterizing how the price changes with respect to a change in value becomes very challenging. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I don't want to oversell the paper in the sense that there have been a, a few other papers thinking about informed trade and voluntary disclosure. Uh, the main difference between our paper and these is that our focus is really going to be on the pricing mechanism. Uh, so the existing literature tends to think about settings where you have a single risk neutral trader that's taking bounded positions. So sort of your simple Kyle model. Okay, so uh, in these models, the valuation consequences of disclosure are, are fairly straightforward. And therefore these papers are typically thinking about other questions, not so much uh, pricing. So we're, again, we're going to be thinking about voluntary disclosure and what is basically a fairly off the shelf model of trade among multiple investors. Sort of along the, along the same lines, there's other work that's documented potential crowding in relationships uh, between voluntary and mandatory disclosure. Uh, these papers tend to assume that there's some kind of some correlation between uh, the mandatory and the voluntary disclosure or potentially a correlation just between the, the possibility that uh, the agents releasing these disclosures have information to disclose in the first place. Okay, so we're not going to have these sorts of correlations. I just want to emphasize this because uh, it, we're based, we, we are documenting what is a novel channel relative to these papers. Hey, Kevin. <clears throat> yeah. This isn't to take away from, from your paper or these, but I, I think it gets back a little bit to Jeremy's uh, question too. Unfortunately, it's a bit of shameless self-promotion. So Beatrice and I and Jack Hughes have a couple of recent papers uh, where in, in one setting, it, in a JE paper, the discretionary disclosure uh, is about the same information as the mandatory disclosure, but you've got the firm choosing the properties of the mandatory disclosure. Uh, and in, in the other paper, which uh, you know, it, it's a working paper, uh, the, the underlying pieces of information or the underlying states are not correlated. Um, and it's the, okay. a regulator designing the reporting rules and that influences the firm's incentives to acquire information. So it's, it's a very different setting. It's not about pricing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but if to the extent that you, you think you're, to the extent that you're building on the set of results about interactions between effectively mandatory disclosure 
which may relate to prior, you know, prior beliefs or prior information and voluntary disclosure. I, I think, I think we, we point out some interesting um, potential interactions yeah, there yeah. as well. No, thanks for bringing that to my attention. I, I was aware of these papers, but I, they didn't, I, I just completely forgot about them when we were doing the literature review. Uh, so do you find a crowding in relationship there? Or? Yeah. It, yeah. We, okay. we I, I'll send them to you and maybe try to write something up separately. Okay. But uh, Great. there's Thank you. The, the interesting aspects of that are the complementarity and the substitution relationships between, you know, how, how informative the mandatory reports are and then uh, the properties of discretionary disclosure, both how often you get disclosure and things like that. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, so from a technical perspective, we're building on some fairly recent work in economics and finance that has shown how to solve rational expectations models when you get outside of normal distributions. Uh, we're also building on our co-author Snehal's work that shows how to nest disagreement in rational expectations models. And we're gonna use this concept of a marginal investor to provide an intuitive form for price that comes from uh, another paper in economics on Bagley et al. Okay, so this brings me to the model. Starting with the financial market, we have a fairly standard set of baseline assumptions here. We have a continuum of investors that are trading in a stock and a bond. The bond has a uh, return that's normalized to one. The stock is going to pay off a one-time dividend, so it's a single period model, and this dividend is uh, we'll call V, which is normally distributed with mean normalized to zero and variance sigma sub V squared. Investors will have car utility and risk tolerance tau. Uh, and finally, the firm is going to be in zero net supply. <laughs> okay, so this assumption is how we are embedding this notion that the disclosure is on an idiosyncratic component of risk. Of course, we could add an additional systematic uh, source of dividends that would add to a risk premium that has nothing to do with the firm's disclosure without changing any of our results. Okay, but by having a zero net supply, what we're doing is assuming that this piece of risk is something that the average investor is not holding any of in their portfolio because it's a small portion of uh, their terminal consumption. So the information structure is the one thing that is a little bit less orthodox, okay? And that's because it's more general than uh, these typical models, okay? So this is where we're using the results from uh, our co-author's paper, where we have a setting where you're nesting both disagreement and rational expectations. So investor I is gonna observe a signal S sub I that's equal to the firm's value V plus an error term, epsilon I. Uh, these error terms are independent. They have variance sigma sub epsilon squared. And the important thing is that while investor I perceives that their own signal is valuable, they're overconfident in the sense that they potentially believe that other investors' signals are less than fully informative. Okay, so the structure here is that investor I believes that other investors' signals are, rather than just depending upon V, they depend upon a weighted average of V and this other variable, uh, Xi. Okay, and so V and Kazi have the same distribution and the weight on the two, the weight on the, the V is rho uh, and the remaining weight is one minus rho squared to the one half. The important so thing here- just, just a very quick question. Yeah. So how important is this overconfidence of each investor about his or her own signal? Do we really need that piece? So we only need it for our evaluation results. Um, we don't really need it. It's just that we are able to point out that there's an interesting result we get when investors do not fully utilize the information and price, which I think is a, a reasonable assumption, uh, especially in this political climate. It's quite clear that people do not necessarily view other people's information as valid. Uh, yep. yep. Sorry, just to clarify the question again, probably it's in the paper, but I didn't get to it. Previously, you said that, you know, we have overpricing and underpricing, depending on whether we have difference of opinion or the standard rational expectation model, noise rational mm -hmm. expectations. So, so rho seems to capture the degree of difference of opinion. And is it sufficient to have rho even, what do we need, close to zero or one? 
and you would still get the different results compared to noise irrational expectation with respect to the underpricing, yes. overpricing. Yes, that's true. It's certainly continuous so that if you get row, say, near zero or near one, you get the, uh, the same results as the extremes. Uh, on the other hand, it's sort of surprisingly non-monotonic once you get into the interior uh, levels of row. And they're fairly subtle features of uh, the rational expectations models. So we're not emphasizing them so much as we are uh, the extremes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just do want to emphasize that when rho goes to one, you get exactly the hell week model. Okay, so we're not reducing the generality here, we're increasing it. When rho goes to zero, we get exactly the case where investors ignore the information in price. And we'll also assume that there's noise trade z uh, that's normally distributed with mean zero invariant sigma sub z squared, which will ensure that the price doesn't fully reveal investors' information. Uh, when uh, investors are in fact utilizing the information in price. The disclosure decision is fairly standard from a Varechia style model. Uh, the manager is going to observe the firm's value and they can verifiably disclose this to the market. We'll assume it's a personally incurred cost that they endure uh, when they disclose and we'll call this C. The results are completely robust to the possibility that this cost is endured on the firm. Uh, the reason that we don't do it that way is that it involves introducing another term into price and we're already dealing with a price that looks quite different than what you would see in conventional models. So we just wanna keep the expressions as intuitive as possible. So in our baseline case, we'll assume the manager's always informed and again, we'll come back later to relax that assumption. Okay, so getting into the meat of the analysis, we start can out I, by- Can, I, can yeah. I jump in with a quick question? Coming back to, to um, Jeremy's uh, earlier remark. So, so uh, as far as I understand this setting, so there's no uh, scope for mandatory disclosed information in that model. So you just have the voluntary disclosed information and then you have the private information that must be inferred from the price. So, so how would the presence of a mandatory disclosed signal uh, affect your results? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it's coming before the disclosure, that's actually the way we'll, that we will capture that when we get into these crowding in, crowding out results is by changing the precision of the prior. Okay, and so this is just sort of a hacky way to do it, but if you actually introduce a signal uh, that equals the firm's value plus noise, similar to investors' private signals, you'll get the exact same results. And you know, this is coming from some of Einhorn's work in the 2000s that just shows basically a, uh, the signal itself influences the mean and it influences the variance. The mean effect doesn't end up influencing the probability of disclosure at all because it's just a location shift in the distribution. So I think my, my earlier point maybe is getting inflated too much. Uh, I, I think one way to think about this in the prior is really this is the outside information environment. That's what Ayn Oren is doing in her in her top paper. So it's probably affected by regulators, but it's mostly affected by the information that comes from other sources like analysts and everybody else. Right? right. There's nothing yeah. lost in viewing it this way. That's right. Yep. It's any information that it's just out there prior to the, the firm's disclosure decision. Yeah. Okay, so what we do to actually solve the models, we'll start by conjecturing a threshold equilibrium. That is one in which the manager discloses if and only if their value is greater than some T. Uh, and, you know, we haven't been able to fully rule out every other type of equilibrium but we've been able to rule out pretty much everything else that seems reasonable. So there's no equilibrium in which managers disclose bad news. There's no equilibrium in which they disclose only moderate news or only extreme news. Potentially there are other weird equilibria where managers disclose in multiple intervals, but it is very difficult to characterize those equilibria analytically. If they exist, we don't know. Um, <clears throat> So if we do make this conjecture of a threshold equilibrium, well, 
because the managers perfectly observe V on our model, which is just a simplifying assumption, but uh, doesn't really cost us any generality. Because they're, they're observing V, the, man, the firm's price is going to be V if they disclose. It's, it's a perfect signal. Where things become more complicated is when the manager doesn't disclose because now investors make this inference that they must not have disclosed because their value fell below the threshold T. And that leaves them with a non-normal distribution, specifically a truncated normal distribution. Okay, because we're outside of normality, we no longer have the existence of a simple linear equilibrium in the financial market where price depends linearly upon the firm's value and noise trade. So this is where we are gonna to start to use some of the techniques from the work by Brian Drish for general or solving these rational expectations models in more general settings. And I'll try and give you some intuition for how this works, but uh, it is probably somewhat subtle if you haven't seen it before. Uh, so if you really want to get some more details on how how you can solve these models, I definitely recommend looking at the Brion Trish paper, which I, I think is really just a, an amazing paper. Sorry, Kevin, can I just ask you a modeling question? Yeah, sure. Um, so so if you had modeled the V as having two comp being the sum of two components, one that the manager knows and one that nobody knows, and both of these are normal, then conditional on both disclosure and no disclosure, I would still be in the standard normal framework. Right. So I just I just wonder like in the sense like what what does the additional complexity buy you that you want to be outside of the normal framework? Wait, so if the manager's value is the sum of two normals and they you were to conjecture a threshold equilibrium, it's still going to be the case that if the manager doesn't disclose, uh, you're going to face uncertainty or that's not of a normal nature because you still know it fell below a threshold, right? Oh, sorry. You're right. My bad. But yeah, I mean, it, it is an interesting extension still because um, it, I believe it will change the exact nature of the uncertainty that you face conditional on not seeing a disclosure because you have this additive risk component. Uh, so the first thing we do to actually solve for the equilibrium is we define the, ag the average signal of investors as S bar, uh, which is actually going to equal V, the firm's value, because they they observe um, idiosyncratic errors and there's a continuum of investors. But the reason we write it as S bar is because investors, again, might not accurately perceive the information in other investors' signals. So from investor I's perspective, this might also depend upon some uh, noise component. So let's not worry about that too much for the purposes of of the talk just because it adds a lot of complexity and you can just think about S bar as V for now. Uh, so the firm's non-disclosure price, uh, let me move back for a second. What we're gonna do is we're gonna conjecture an equilibrium in, in which the firm's non-disclosure price is a linear function of S bar and Z. So this is what we call a generalized linear equilibrium. In the sense, you're, you're basically starting out with a linear equilibrium, and then you're just putting a monotonic function around the linear equilibrium. Okay, and the critical thing that occurs here is that because this function is monotone, you can invert it as an investor, and you can get back to the same exact linear signal that you would get in a standard rational expectations model, which means we can apply a lot of the same techniques to calculate investors' posterior beliefs uh, that we would in these typical models. Okay, so the investors observe truth plus noise signals, they have a normal prior. We can just apply Bayes rule to update their beliefs. We can then calculate their demands, use market clearing and solve for the price. Now there's one tricky step here, and that's that when you actually do solve for the price, you have to show that it in fact satisfies the generalized linear equilibrium conjecture. You have to show that it looks, it actually is a monotonic transformation of this linear function, okay? And so that's really where uh, the Brion Drish paper showed exactly when you will get this property and how far you can push these models. It turns, that, turns out that in our setting with voluntary disclosure, the price that you get in fact satisfies this property. 
Okay, so that's sort of our contribution to this literature. So this just shows how you can take the signal that investors get, investors get from price in conjunction with their private signal, update their beliefs. Uh, the main thing I just wanna point out is that because we're dealing with normal distributions, you can think of investors' posterior mean as a sufficient statistic for both of their underlying signals. This is useful because it's gonna let us uh, convey the price in at least what we think is an intuitive fashion. Uh, so this is the price you get here. Uh, what, effectively, what this price captures is the beliefs of what we refer to as a marginal investor. Okay, so the marginal investor is, in this case, an investor whose posterior means, based upon their private signal and the price signal, is equal to the exact price you would get if disclosure was completely uninformative. In other words, if you were just in a standard Helwig-style trading model. So the only way that this, this uh, observation of non-disclosure influences the price is that uh, this marginal investor is also going to incorporate that information in calculating their posterior expectation of the firm's value. Now, I think this is all fairly subtle. So what I wanna do is just show you what this actually looks like when you calculate this expectation. Because if you're familiar with the standard trading models and you're familiar with voluntary disclosure models with normal distributions, the price you get is actually quite intuitive. So what I have at the top here is the price that you would get if the manager was uninformed always and you had informed investors. In other words, this is what you get in like a Hellwig model or a model with differences of opinions. So in this case, you get that the price is equal to the average investors beliefs about expected future cash flows, adjusted for uh, a risk premium that depends upon noise trade, investors' posterior variances, and their risk tolerance. In the second line here, I have the price that you would get in a model where uh, investors are uninformed, but the manager is informed. So a standard voluntary disclosure framework, specifically with normal distributions. So in this case, the price is gonna equal to the prior mean with an adjustment that captures just the fact that investors now know that your value fell below this threshold. Uh, this adjustment happens to be the inverse Mills ratio, if you're familiar with this work. Uh, but yes, it, it just depends upon the, uh, the threshold, the, dis the disclosure threshold in equilibrium. Finally, in the last line here, I have the price that we get in our model. Uh, and what we're doing is we're just taking the mean parameter in the non-disclosure price in a, in a model without informed traders. And we're substituting the price that you would get in a model uh, without an informed manager, okay? So this reveals some intuitive features of this non-disclosure price. It's gonna increase an investor's posterior means. It's gonna increase in noise trade. Uh, it's going to increase as the disclosure threshold grows higher. So it satisfies a lot of the intuitive properties that you would expect based upon standard models of disclosure. So with that established, we can move back and actually calculate or solve for the disclosure equilibrium. And we're gonna show that there is in fact a threshold equilibrium and it's gonna be characterized by indifference of the manager who observes the threshold value. Okay, so if the manager observing the threshold value discloses, they're just gonna get their value adjusted for the cost that they have to pay to disclose. If they don't disclose, well, in this case, there's gonna be trade in the financial market. This trade in part is going to reflect the firm's underlying value. It's also gonna reflect the least trade. So the manager has to take an expectation of this price. Now, this is one of the differentiating factors from models without private information is that this non-disclosure price in part reflects the firm's value. Okay, so this makes characterizing the equilibrium slightly more difficult and it makes the existence of a threshold of equilibrium less obvious. Because in theory, it's possible that the price, this non-disclosure price reacts fully or maybe even more than fully in certain uh, ranges to the firm's value. 
which would mean potentially that the payoffs to disclosing relative to not disclosing might not increase in the firm's value. And that's what happens in the die case. A quick question. You're, you're contradicting then the, uh, that's a different result than the one in Einhorn in the top paper. Is that, is that right? In which you don't disclose that encourage more information being revealed. And that's what makes the, uh, the claim uh, not obvious. The crowding in, crowding out, or which, which Einhorn paper? Uh, the most recent one, I think it might be 2019. Or... Uh, I'd have to think about that. I forget exactly what the mapping is between their assumptions and ours. But so, yeah, the, the key feature of that paper is that the, if you observe non-disclosure, it doesn't reveal anything to you. There's no, uh, there's no inference that can be made because of the combination of assumptions that they have. Oh, okay. So what I remember is it wasn't obvious either in, in this paper, in that paper, because you, when you don't disclose, uh, the information that would be revealed publicly would be different. And so that means the no disclosure isn't necessarily the lowest event. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to go back and think about that. Hmm. So you're saying, Jeremy, that the minimum principle doesn't apply here? Uh, that's right, because now you have other information coming out. That's right. I mean, isn't that also something that you get in the die setting? Or... Uh, but in the die, you have no other information. The only signal that comes out is right, the description. Right disclosure so now right. i think yep. there's a lot more tension uh, yeah yeah and i think that's definitely revealed by the fact that you don't get a threshold equilibrium in the die setting potentially okay so that's basically what we have in terms of establishing the equilibrium we now want to move towards uh, looking at some of the results i mentioned earlier in terms of crowding in crowding out and valuation so the first thing we look at is the disclosure probability as a function of prior uncertainty, which as we've talked about a bit, this is this idea of how does changing external information quality, whether it's mandatory disclosure or some other source, uh, influence the, the likelihood that the manager discloses. And so we find that uh, across all the settings we consider whether investors do or do not utilize information prices, if C grows very large, you can get that higher quality public information leads to more voluntary disclosure. So you can see this in the plot um, towards the upper end of this plot here. As you move to the left, prior uncertainty is going down. In other words, public information is getting better. And you see that the probability of disclosure goes up. So how could this be? Well, there's two offsetting forces. Uh, the first one is what you would get in a standard model without private information, which is that when you make priors less precise, learning that the firm hasn't disclosed is more informative. It pushes your beliefs down to a greater extent. There's sort of more weight in the tail of the, the lower tail of the distributions, you become more uncertain. Uh, and so you're going to push your beliefs down more. This is going to encourage disclosure or push towards crowding out. On the other hand, and this is a novel force to our model, when information, when public information grows more noisy, investors are going to place more weight on their private information signals. Okay, so this means that even if the manager doesn't disclose, their information is still going to get into the price to a greater extent. And this is going to tend to discourage disclosure. Now, if you'd asked me before working on this, which one of these two forces would dominate, I would have said number one would dominate in all cases. But it turns out this is not true. Um, when C grows large, what happens is that the disclosure threshold grows very large. Okay, and this has two effects. Number one, it tends to make the first force really weak. The reason is that when the disclosure threshold gets really large, you're basically gonna be left with your prior of zero or the, the mean of expected cash flows, independent of what the prior variance is. At the same time, force two tends to get stronger because if you think about what determines the likelihood of disclosure, 
it's the it's the firm that's just on the margin between disclosing and not disclosing. That is the threshold firm. Okay, and so as the threshold firm moves up quite a bit, it starts to move away from the average non-disclosing firm. Okay, so they really value uh, having investors place more weight on their signals because they know that those signals are going to be a lot higher uh, than the average non-disclosing firm. So this uh, just depicts the fact that if you look at the overall information quality as you change the precision of the prior, uh, you will tend to get that this increases. Uh, so in other words, investors become less uncertain as their prior information quality goes up when C is high. This is consistent with crowding in. On the other hand, if C is low, so you have crowding out, you can actually have that when uh, investors' priors become noisier, uh, that information quality actually goes up. Okay, in other words, mandatory disclosure when C is low could have the inverse effect as you would expect. It can actually decrease overall information quality. On the other hand, when C is high, we alleviate some of these concerns about crowding out and you have that mandatory disclosure has the desired effect of increasing overall information quality. I wanna to move to thinking about the firm's valuation. Just to reiterate from earlier, we show that when investors exhibit rational expectations, the firm's undervalued. In other words, it's expected non-disclosure price is less than it's expected cash flows given non-disclosure. This also maps into an ex-ante sense. The firm's expected price is less than its expected cash flows. Uh, and in the difference of opinion setting, you, you can get the same thing if noise trade is really high, but if noise trade is low, then you get the exact opposite result. You get that the firm is overvalued. So I wanna talk about this in some detail because I think it reveals a lot about how price uh, aggregates investors' beliefs when you move away from normal distributions and provides a lot of insight into the underlying economics uh, behind our model. So it's again the case that there's two offsetting forces on valuation. Uh, the first one has to do with how investors' conditional uncertainty changes as their signal changes. In other words, if you think about the uncertainty of investors who get optimistic signals and those who get pessimistic signals, how do those compare? Okay, and so this, this can be seen by looking at the actual distributions that are faced by investors who get high versus low signals when they've observed non-disclosure. So in the figure here, I plotted the, these distributions assuming that the disclosure cutoff is one. Uh, the red line is an optimistic investor. The yellow line is a pessimistic investor. What do you see? You see that this optimistic investor has beliefs that are concentrated near the threshold. And because they're optimistic, they know that it's cut off at one, you're going to start to push their beliefs around this tight point around the threshold. Okay, on the other hand, if an investor gets a very negative signal, they still have the full range of uncertainty. Okay, so the effect of this truncation on their uncertainty becomes negligible. An equivalent way of thinking about this is that when you observe non-disclosure, you have negative skewness, which means that the mean and the variance are inversely correlated. Okay, so what is the impact of this on valuation? When you have optimistic traders being less uncertain, they tend to trade more aggressively than pessimistic traders. And this tends to push up the firm's price. So this is one force. The second force uh, comes back to something that you may have seen if you were here for Davide's talk in the summer, which has to do with the impact of noise trade on prices uh, in a non-normal uh, case. So what happens is that noise trade is going to have a concave impact on prices. Noise trade is symmetric. It has a concave impact. This means that overall it's going to tend to push down the firm's price. Why does it have a concave impact on prices? There's a couple of ways to think about this. Uh, one is just that we're dealing with a bounded distribution of payoffs. This means the firm's price is never going to exceed the upper bound. 
So noise trade can only push up the price so far, but it can push down the price as, as far as you want. Another way to think about this that, that we sort of were emphasizing in, in the paper with Davide is that uh, if you think about a trader who's long, in other words, a trader who's trading against noise trader sales, uh, they face unlimited downside. There's no bound to how low the price can go for these traders. So the risk premium they demand is significant, which starts to uh, push down how much noise trader purchases can inflate the price. The opposite is true if you're thinking about traders who are short. So what is the net effect of these two forces? Well, <clears throat> it turns out that in the rational expectation setting, this noise trader effect is a lot stronger because in noise trade influences prices in two ways, directly through the supply of the security that in rational investors have to bear, and then indirectly through the fact that it's also influencing investors' beliefs in equilibrium because they can't distinguish whether this change in price was driven by noise trade or actual trade on information. And this also explains why in the differences of opinion case, you can still get undervaluation if you push noise trade up significantly high, whereas you always get overvaluation if noise trade goes to zero. Something else that was kind of surprising to us here is that uh, if you look at the, the actual absolute amount of misvaluation, so the size of this under versus overvaluation, it can be larger in the case where investors exhibit rational expectations which means that investors are better utilizing the information available to them, and yet prices less accurately reflect the value of the firm. Just to sort of reiterate, the reason that we think these results are kind of interesting is because this is, again, purely idiosyncratic uh, information, uh, and yet we're finding that it has a price impact. Another thing that's sort of interesting about this is if you think about standard voluntary disclosure models, it's typically the case that managers, if they could, would commit themselves not to disclose uh, specifically information that has no impact on the risk premium. The reason is that disclosure is costly, but on average, you're not gonna change investors' beliefs just by rational expectations. Okay, here on the other hand, if investors exhibit differences of opinion, disclosure can create overvaluation. Uh, and we've actually shown that this, the extent of this overvaluation can exceed the expected disclosure costs incurred by managers, which means that they actually like this opportunity uh, to disclose. Okay, So potentially, if they have the opportunity to acquire information, they would do so, a feature that's not present in standard models, models of disclosure. So it looks like I will have a minute to talk about the die setting. Um, the first thing I just want to emphasize, we'll, we'll call this parameter that de denotes the- So, so Ke Ke Kevin, can oh, I jump in yeah. with another question? I mean, that should sure. be applicable to the die as well. So I, I think you have an interesting result that you know if you increase the prior information or precision, then overall information can either increase or decrease. Uh, can you also do the analysis to, let's say, if you increase by 1% the private signal that each investor gets, could that result in a decrease in overall posterior information? So are you you're saying the actual realized signal or the precision of the- The, the, the precision. The precision. Okay, let's so say, that, uh, yeah, that's a good point. That actually works out how you would expect. So if investors have more precise private information signals, uh, it does tend to, actually, no, that I think about it, that's not an analysis that we've done in terms of, I was thinking about can, if you hold fix the firm's disclosure decision, but. No, no, but I want to, uh, to keep it endogenous, right, right. yeah. Yeah, that's something we should definitely look at because that, mm -hmm. that could be interesting because there is a crowding out relationship there where investors get better private information, there's less disclosure, but it's not clear to me whether that can actually lead to a reduction in information quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I should say Vaughn is, is taking notes on all your questions, so they'll definitely be helpful in revising the paper. Uh, 
So in this die setting, we end up getting a price that looks very similar to our baseline case. The only difference is that we now have a different inference made from non-disclosure. So we just have to take into account that managers, or sorry, the investors know the manager might not have disclosed because they just didn't have information. Okay, so you can calculate the price as a conditional expectation just as before uh, of a marginal investor. It's just that this also reflects this other possibility. There is one big difference though, which has to do with how strongly the price responds to the firm's value. Uh, what we do is we actually provide an analytical characterization of this that has to do with investors' posterior uncertainty after observing non-disclosure. Uh, so this is kind of a generalization of the Bayesian updating formula you get with normals. Um, and we show that when investors are more uncertain after the disclosure, that actually leads to a stronger price reaction. It's just capturing the fact that if there's more uncertainty, investors place more weight on their signals. Now, the reason that you can get a very strong price reaction in this model is because if you see non-disclosure, it can increase your uncertainty. And this is something that was shown by Diane Hughes. The idea is that you have a lot of uncertainty, not just about the firm's cash flows conditional on the manager being informed or uninformed, you also don't know whether they were informed or uninformed. And this can lead to a very different set of outcomes in terms of the expected value of the firm if you have a very low disclosure threshold. And this is what causes the threshold equilibrium potentially to break down. So I plotted this in the figure here. You just see that you can get up in the red line, I have the, the Vrechia case and the blue line, I have the die case. Uh, when investors' information is really precise, you can have that this blue line, which represents the net benefit to disclosure, can cross zero at two different points. Okay, so we show that our results are recovered for high C, uh, even when you have a manager that's not necessarily informed. On the other hand, uh, if C goes to zero, so you're in a pure die setting, you're going to get crowding out. You won't get crowding in, the reason being that Crowding in relied on a high disclosure threshold. In a die setting, the disclosure threshold is pushed down typically below the posterior mean. Uh, and as a result, yeah, again, you're, you're just going to get the crowding in relationship. Okay, so I'll skip the valuation results and just wrap up here. Uh, again, we're, what we're doing is just combining what we view as two important models, sets of models in the literature, voluntary disclosure models and models of trade on private information, and showing that when you combine these two models, you tend to get impacts of disclosure on prices and public information on the likelihood of disclosure that significantly differ from standard models. Our goal has been to stick as closely as possible to these standard models, but in doing so, We've made some simplifying assumptions that can be explored in future literature. So something that could be interesting is thinking about investor information acquisition, manager information acquisition, um, pre and post public information. So pre-disclosure and post-disclosure public information. And also the possibility that the firm's cash flows depend upon something like an investment decision or so you can incorporate some notion of real effects uh, of voluntary disclosure. So that's all I have for you. And thank you very much for all of the comments.